Today we have a special guest, Jerzy Forster, an associate professor at the University of New South Wales, Australia Business School. And today, Professor Forster will present um, uh, peer facts and theory estimations. So please have a look. I don't speak very good Russian, so I will be speaking in English, which you should be thankful for. Um, so can I just ask before I start, uh, what are the disciplinary backgrounds here? Who is an economist? Who is a sociologist? Who is a psychologist? Right, okay, that's good. So my talk is really from an economic perspective because I am an economist. So some of you who are economists may be expecting to see a bit more technical detail in a typical research talk than I have. But I didn't want to put too much in because I was expecting there would be sociologists and psychologists here too. And I certainly uh, I want to include their uh, perspectives and also get their feedback on what I'm, what I'm saying and uh, hopefully have some interaction around that. So. Um, so I was asked to give a talk on frontiers, so I'm, what I'm going to do is give a, a bit of a background on where I see the field at present um, in estimation of peer effects, particularly in educational contexts, and then I'm going to talk about where I think the most productive kind of research activity might happen uh, going forward. So first a little about me. So my perspective is very much informed by my general interest in uh, analyzing the effects of groups on individual people, not just in education settings, but in the, the broader society. Uh, I think it's, it's not only that um, economists have been too locked into the individual um, optimization perspective, but also that there's just a lot to be learned about the broader society that we cannot, uh, we cannot possibly hope to do unless we are being able to bring out into the scene, into the visible, some of the unseen constraints that groups pose on people's behavior from an economic perspective. So do we can still do individual level analysis uh, in economics, which is our typical thing, our typical workhorse kind of analysis, but try to uh, capture some of the unseen constraints posed by, by society. Um, I'm particularly interested in education settings and most of my work has been in relation to um, higher education. So what happens in classrooms with uh, different kinds of peers, either higher or lower ability peers in those classrooms. Research that I do and I think most of us would have are both an understanding, a better understanding of what is actually happening in the people, in the mind of people when they are in a social setting compared to when they're not or when they are in different kinds of social settings, but also some notion of policy relevance. And those two goals are not always able to be achieved together. So we were having a discussion earlier today about um, you know, wanting to understand what's happening in, in uh, the classroom, for example, with high and low ability peers. But in a situation where you really don't have any capacity to influence the institutions around sorting or, or the way students are, are treated in those classrooms, the way they are grouped, there's not a whole lot of room for policy relevance. So we sometimes will find that you know, we can understand things very well, but there's very little we can do about that. At other moments, we may think, well, I, I, can, I can come up with some kind of a policy, but it may not actually hold outside this particular setting because I don't really understand what's going on just have a kind of reduced form model of some sort it seems to fit and so okay I'll make a policy on the basis of that and that can be very dangerous even if you are making a policy for that particular context because you know from year to year there are changes different changes and if you are unable to understand what's going on and you're not controlling for all of these factors then your prediction about what would happen if you changed some kind of institutional structure may be off and there's a very famous example of that that's just just happened in the literature we'll talk about a little later so so those are the, the two general things that I'm interested in and that I think sometimes uh, are in conflict. So why do people do peer effects research generally? Well, again, one major component is policy advice about how to sort students into classrooms um, or sometimes into dormitories, into some sort of social setting or how much choice to allow students. So in relation to, for example, group work in university classrooms, sometimes there is an assignment that needs to be done by three students at once some professors will assign students randomly to these groups, others will let them sort right, however they like, and there's this kind of assumption in a lot of peer effects research that that's the kind of policy decision that we're going to be relevant to. Right? 
if I find out that, oh, high ability students, you know, are really good for low ability students, but not as good for other high ability students, then, oh, I should take all my high ability students and make sure that they're with the low ability students. So it's a very common justification. Even though, in fact, it doesn't always uh, turn out <laughs> to be that, that relevant, but that is, that is often, or even to, to be something that the, the peer effects researchers uh, proceed to develop real advice on. That's often still hand wavy, this is why I'm important kind of uh, statement. There is also sometimes the potential to change the way that the social architecture looks. So for example, you may put dormitories on campus if you think that they're going to be peer effects among students. You might start actually building those, those uh, places for them to live on campus rather than having them live off campus. You might have different kinds of communication systems that you're supporting uh, so that students can you know, learn differently from each other. An example of this that I was talking about last a couple of weeks ago with my head of school is the idea that you might, for example, want to start having uh, houses which celebrate different um, ethnicities on a particular campus so that you then say, okay, here is the place to go if you want to learn about what you know Chinese culture or whatever has to offer. So the students, the Chinese students can go there, they can you know, have support, and the domestic students can also benefit because maybe the, that house can sponsor, you know, the New Year celebration, Chinese New Year celebration, or food festivals or something like this. So the way that students are communicating with each other then is more out in the open um, and more sort of uh, supported institutionally uh, these, these different identities. So the communication that the students have with each other might sometimes be uh, also something you care about uh, changing. You also often want to know, uh, in some sense, what are the consequences of individuals' group identity or social position. So you often will find uh, peer effect studies where they're, they're thinking about particular subgroups, like, like women or um, international students or, or you know, mature age students or something, and what happens to those people in particular when they are in groups with other kinds of students. So it's, a, it's really about the consequences for that particular person or the consequences for the group learning as a whole of, of you know, having more of those kinds of people or having a, a group a position of those people in, in a particular way. So all of these things are essentially assuming that there is some sort of unseen incentive that's created by the social aspects of the individual's environment. That's not something in economics typically uh, has addressed. Right? Typically the, the social aspect of somebody's production is sort of considered um, incidental, um, often accidental, and not really consequential for productivity unless you're talking about ex productive exchange with comparatively you know, specialized students. So if you're specializing in writing and I'm specializing in, um, I don't know, programming, then we can combine together and make you know, something better than we could alone. But that's not really what peer effects people typically have in mind. So the kind of context you will find in the typical economics peer effects study is you'll have some kind of measurable outcome. It's often a grade or a mark or you know, some performance. You'll have some mapping of people into groups, and these are observable groups typically, so you know, classrooms or something. And you'll have some sort of cross-sectional individual level data on that target outcome, and you have some idea of what predicts it. Now in the context here, for example, I know we have these Russian Olympiads, right? These things, special contests, and so you'll have an indicator for whether the student you know, did well in this Olympiad. Right? And that, that's in the data often. You'll have maybe race data, or you'll have data on uh, gender or age or whatever you think might possibly predict the outcome. Um, and it's obviously observable data, right? And so you have this in the cross section at a minimum. Sometimes you'll have a panel. So what this looks like is something like this. I mean, it's nice to think of what we're, what we're really uh, analyzing pictorially. So you'll have maybe three different periods, let's say period one, period two, and period three. In each of these periods, you would then have a collection of people in a set of subgroups. And again, in each of those subgroups, you're looking at each individual differently. So here, for example, I'm just saying, let's say this is your target individual. You'll say this person is in a group of, you know, eight people, seven people, and, you know, six others. And he is kind of not maybe not not close to these people, but a little closer to these people, and you know uh, he may have some sort of outcome which is influenced in some way by the nature of these people, what their what their background characteristics are, maybe how they're behaving, whatever. Same thing here, but then you do this this analysis potentially for each individual, right? So you have all of these people, the individual dots are are individuals who are then uh, whose data are collected, and then you can form sort of information on each of their groups whether it's how close they are to all the different members, what the size of the group is, what the types of these other members are, uh, something about the distribution of the background characteristics of those members, right? There's all sorts of things you could measure about those things, about those, the, the peer group. 
And then you may have this for multiple different years, right? And in each of these cases, you know, you're, you're basically taking these subgroups as given frequently. And so you're saying classes, that's, that's typically what's happening, or sometimes residential groups. Um, and you just see, you know, what are the differences that you see between performance of these different individuals and how much of that is uh, attributable in your reduced form model to, to differences in the characteristics of the peers, or how close you are to the peers, or you know, in terms of your background characteristics. So that's kind of the, the, the type of map that we have in mind. You can also sometimes follow people through time. So you, know, you say, okay, this person has this peer group in this time, and then this peer group there, and that peer group there. Sometimes that's actually through time. Sometimes it's uh, people who are taking different courses. And so in each of those different courses, they have uh, a different peer group. So that's kind of the, the minimum data set that you have. And here, Maria, I know, has the capacity, for example, to follow a cohort of students from time one to time two to time three. And she can see you know, in the first year that they are randomly assigned into these study groups. And then she can see through time what happens to them. And she's got then changes in the peer group structure over time. And that allows her to you know, identify some different uh, peer, peer group effects. So the kinds of questions that people often have at the individual group level, individual level are first of all, if there are more type X people in your group, does that make you do more Y? And Y is usually, uh, you know, have better performance on an exam or a mark or something like that. But in other kinds of contexts, it can be things like, do I smoke more? Uh, do I do I drink more? Do I sexually initiate earlier? Whatever the thing is, the outcome that we care about. But in the education context, typically that's a mark or a grade, and X is something that the other students come into the game with. So again, their race, their gender, their academic performance. Does being in a particular type of group make me do more why? So that's a contextual effect. It's what you know, Mansky is typical uh, bifurcation of the different kinds of peer effects, which is he's a guy who wrote this big you know, book, Identification of Social Sciences, in the early 2000s, and he, or sorry, 1993, I think it came out, it's been revised. And you know, his main point was there are some times in which you are doing something differently than you otherwise would because of characteristics that you share with the whole group. Not because other people in that group are you know, higher achieving, but just because maybe you all are next to a window where there's construction outside and so you won't do worse, for example. Right? So that's a, that's a group type uh, effect, but it's not really related necessarily to your peers. And finally, this notion that maybe people who are doing a particular thing more, so performing better, that makes me then perform better, which is a difficult thing to, to sort of justify. You have to unpack that. Why would it be that you know somebody else getting a better mark would make me get a better mark? It must be that there is some kind of intervening behavior there. So I don't see what the, what your mark is, right? People in the classroom typically do not see other students' final grades, and so in the context of education, particularly, which is different from smoking. Smoking you can see, right? but with education you can't really see that. So if this kind of uh, process is really what's happening, then there, may be, there must be some sort of intervening um, choice that's being made that, that increases your why, and that's the choice that I then respond to. Yeah. Is there literature on cases in which you can identify the, the treatment effect of letting people know what other grades are? So when I was growing mm -hmm. up, many of the grade schools were openly competitive. Yep. They would post your grades. Exactly. Every term. So is that different for the ones that don't post their grades? Yeah, so there isn't a literature on that as far as I know. In fact, we were talking about that just a couple hours ago. Apparently here you do post grades, right? But in many cases, certainly in Australia, in the data sets that I'm aware of, or the countries that I've used, there's no posting of grades. The US, you don't, you don't post grades, right? So uh, in the sense that we haven't been able to test it, and therefore there hasn't been a motivation to try to discover whether identification would be possible in those, in those situations, no. Now, identification is a real issue, obviously, in this in those literature. We'll talk about that a lot later on. But in terms of the, uh, you know, this kind of endogenous effect, this kind of reflection problem, typically people just, they kind of, the, the most unsophisticated papers simply throw in uh, other people's marks. And just like, oh, well, what's happening? You know, how does it work? But you, there is some, there's got to be some sort of underlying process. There's something wrong with that. Um, so these are actually really questions that are arising not in economics originally, but in social and evolutionary psychology mainly. Um, you know, you're sort of thinking about how people are responding optimally to other people in the group because of uh, evolutionary reasons or you know social reasons. That we're using. So at the whole group level, you can ask as an economist questions more about overall welfare, and, and that's sort of being the, the main point of economics, right? We sort of want better things for whole groups. So the kind of questions you would then want to ask with the peer effect study would be what kind of social mechanisms would lead to higher outcome equilibria? 
And again, some of one of the social mechanisms, mechanisms might, might be how to assign students to groups, because I can get a better result overall for the whole group if I distribute my high achievers, let's say, right? Or maybe even if I, if I stream, maybe that works better, right? Um, so one of the problems with this, so we, we, there was actually a recent study, this is um, uh, Scott Carroll's paper in 2013, who tried, in fact, to um, answer this question using data from, uh, you know, from his West Point or whatever it was. He got an answer about how to distribute students across uh, different groups that was based on his, you know, assumption about how peer groups work, and then he was able to implement the, the implications of his study in the field by assigning students according to what it looked like they should be assigned to. And, and as it hurt, happened, in fact, he hurt the students he was trying to help. So the students, the low income, so low, low ability students were grouped with higher ability students and they didn't benefit. Even though his model said that they should be benefiting from the previous year, that's exactly what it looked like. And the explanation that he and his co-authors offered is that, well, these lower ability students sort of must have formed subgroups and they weren't really influenced by the whole group that we assigned them to because they weren't, you know, sort of sorting endogenously within each other. And that is a, that's a canonical problem. So you never know for sure who is actually interacting with whom in these classrooms, right? It's very, very, very difficult to, to identify that, to see that, to monitor it. And so we're often stuck with just, look, it's a group. It's a classroom. You know, that's all that I've got. I can't see people's friendships. And I don't know, and even if I could see people's friendships, I may be choosing people to, to interact with based on something about my own performance. So I can't then say, well, I choose you, and therefore, you know, when, when you do better, I do better, that means that you're affecting me. It could just be, well, I'm just, you know, going to choose you because I want to be with a high ability person because I'm also high ability, something like that. So you can't, because there's no randomization of friendship choice, you can't get around that. Right? So that's a very, very standard problem, and I was actually... I don't know, I wasn't glad to see them not able to, to you know, uh, come up with a, a workable system, but it, it was sort of confirming of, of um, you know, my doubts about that. So another uh, issue that happens, and this is what Carol and, and his co-authors are essentially trying to place the blame on, is the creation of subgroup identities within a given group. Um, if you know that that's possible, then maybe there are things we can do to sort of encourage or discourage um, you know, different constellations of subgroup identities within that group. So if you have, uh, for example, multiple different contests, uh, contests that are being run for, uh, for a classroom and you allow different people to win different contests and sort of they divide themselves in, in terms of their, uh, you know, their supposed comparative advantage this way, that might be beneficial in terms of giving everybody some sense of their own potential, their own value, and then you sort of break them into groups and they don't feel as discouraged as perhaps Carol's students did. So you might think about some kind of intervention to encourage subgroup identities that would then lead to better equilibrium, given the social effects that there are. Okay. So even though these are really group level questions, typically, and you know, we, we want to answer those group level questions because we're so sure of maximizing as economists, we typically are still using individual level models in the economics of all products. So that's a, that's a basic conflict as well. And we try to always go from the individual production equation where you have an outcome predicted by these various things about the social environment to some conclusion about how to manage the entire social environment. It's uh, not very satisfactory. So the kind of more basic questions then, if you go back a step further, that are really underlying a lot of peer effect studies, first of all, we don't really know how people form friendships and group identities. I did do a paper on this in 2005, but it's, there are not many studies of that in economics. Now, I know you guys, the sociologists and psychologists, you have some of these, these studies for sure. In economics, it's been hamstrung, really, uh, this kind of research, mainly because we you know, we, we don't actually start from a clean slate. So friendships are often formed so endogenously, and whoever you are friends with originally is sort of then informing who you're friends with next, that it becomes a, kind of a, an infinite loop in terms of mapping people's friendships and being able to say something that's policy relevant about, uh, you know, how they would influence each other. So, you know, this has been an issue, but this is something that is clearly happening in these, in these peer groups. They can form subgroups, they can form friendships within them that are much more influential than the whole group or much less influential. Secondly, you know, how is it that people are learning from each other? Are they learning because they don't know when they first come, some of them anyway, to a peer group, they don't know how education production works? Do they not know how to study, for example? Do they not know how to, you know, uh, persevere in a, or, or ask questions in a classroom? Is it a question of learning how to behave properly, learning how to do better? Um, 
if that's what we think is happening, well, how do they get that information? Do they just observe each other? Do they, you know, do they exchange notes after class? I and mean, what is actually going on to exchange information, to, to increase people's information about the production function? Um, we don't really know that. Right? And that's another, another area which I think is something that would be nice to see more economic research because it is something about sort of reducing barriers to, uh, to production. We also don't really know in many peer effect studies what the counterfactual learning context is. So most learning occurs in a social context, right? Most learning now today is you know, in universities and in high schools as well as in classrooms. You have multiple people being taught by an individual you know, teacher or something. And that wasn't always the case. You often had these apprenticeship models back in, you know, like in antiquity. But what would we do differently now? So what is the counterfactual? Are we going to, you know, is there a possibility of completely changing that sort of one-to-many model in some totally different way so students are educating each other? Um, is, it, is it possible to put the student sort of by himself in a closet somewhere and do study? There's, there's something that's sort of the baseline against which you're comparing the peer effect. And that baseline is often not made as explicit as it could be in, in a lot of studies, but it's something that always needs to be, you know, that's, that's always a new one. And we also, of course, as, as a result of all of these things, and, and because of contextual differences in general across cultures and many other reasons, we don't really know whether a particular result will hold in other social learning contexts. And so there's just, the literature is just not at the point where you could say, oh yes, I see this peer effect in this particular university, and therefore I am confident that this would exist in some other university. There's just way too many things that are different. So it's very frustrating from that perspective. There's no, really not very much um, yeah, in the way of stylized facts across multiple different contexts um, that I've seen. And all of these things are about you know, sociology, social psychology, economics, just all sorts of social science and all that stuff. Just a very, very complex thing. And so economists are trying to approach it as best they can, but they, they are hampered by a, a number of things. And this is my sort of cheat list or, you know, sort of quick list of all of the problems that we experience. Right? And, and not really in any exact order, but I would say endogenous group formation is the biggest one. So, and I've just put in here several papers that are, you know, informative about each of these things. If anybody wants these papers, I'm happy to send them. So, Endogenous group formation is this issue that um, if people are allowed to choose their groups, so choose their classrooms, for example, choose their courses, then they are likely to choose them in a way that is related to their unobserved production potential. So the better quality students will choose to be in classes with other better quality students. Not necessarily in order to be with the other quality students, but just because all higher quality students want that particular class, for example. If that happens, then you, if you're running a standard peer effects equation, which we'll go through in a moment, then you have this correlation between the unobserved component of the individual's performance and the peer ability, which you often are using as the um, catalyst for the peer effect. And so then you cannot assume that it's in fact the peer quality that's driving performance, but it could be just the individual's unobservable quality. So that is problem number one, which people try to get around and we'll talk about well, how they do that, but that is certainly a much more big, much larger problem in economics, or at least through the economics lens, than it is, for example, for psychology or, or um, sociology. Second problem, and I would say this is also a, a big one, is measurement error, or the impossibility of measurement. So the impossibility of measurement problem is that you don't really know what it is about your social context that is affecting you. We don't have particularly good theory in this area in economics yet, so we don't really, um, you know, we don't know even what to ask about other about the peers. All we can do is take typically what's in a given data set, which will be you know, previous academic performance is the most common one. Sometimes your race group or your gender group, okay? but it, it, we don't know that that's the thing that really matters. It could be, you know, your motivation to learn. It could be your orientation towards life. It could be any number of things about you, whether you share a, a political party membership with me. I mean, I, we don't know what it is about you that may make you affect me. And same thing with this measurement error in something that we that we think is important, but we don't, you know, can't measure properly. And so there's always a um, And so this is something that's also come up a lot in the literature, and many people uh, gloss over it because they simply go with whatever is in their data set, and they say that's the, that's the, so, that's the source of the fear effect, and want to think more about it. There's a recent paper by Josh Angris in 2014 which talks about a mechanical correlation you have in outcomes with own uh, performance and peer performance. And the reason this arises is because 
typically when we're doing peer effect analysis, you have um, an individual performance and then you have others in the group. And when you take the average of the group's performance, if you want to use their, um, you know, their outcome as a predictor, you exclude the person himself, right? So you have two people, if it's a group of three, let's say, two people are the peer group against the individual. Similarly, for this person, it would be these two peers, and for this person, it's these two peers. If you imagine then taking sort of the, you know, one person out, like the highest ability person out, then the peer performance variable, or performance average, is going to be lower than that person is taken out. When you take the lowest ability person out, the peer performance is also going to be very different, right? It's going to be higher than the individual. And so you sort of produce a mechanical negative correlation across the whole sample of individual versus peer data. Uh, between own and, and peer performance. And this is an issue because, uh, you know, then you can't actually interpret any peer effect that you might derive from that kind of specification uh, in terms of causal uh, interaction, causal factor. So it's really mechanical. So that's a problem. And Agnes has just been talking about this recently. It's maybe less of a problem if you're not doing an endogenous effects model, but it can still be, uh, be a problem. Endogenous effects within the group are just, again, a huge problem, so the reflection problem. And this is something where I think there is, there's even more consideration in the literature recently that this is just a, an almost insurmountable problem, probably extremely important, and there's just not much that people have been able to do about it. Jane Cooley, um, actually it's in fact Jane Cooley through with, she got married fairly recently. She has, I think, the best recent papers on this. So if anybody is interested in a really, really good discussion of uh, the issues with endogenous effects, I would refer you to her papers. If there are endogeneity uh, problems in your in a, a social context where you know you do something, then I do something, and if I do something, then you do something, then you end up with these sort of you know feedback loop kind of problems, and there are many different equilibria to to define the possibility space for uh, the outcome for that kind of issue, that kind of uh, context, and that's a problem. So we could have an equilibrium, for example, where you and I both work not very much at all, and we have an equilibrium where you and I both work a lot. And it's very hard to kind of identify that from a theoretical perspective. And again, Jane Cooley has a very nice um, exposition of that. Um, and this is one of the reasons why empiricists have just not ventured into this problem very much, because it's just a big mess. We can't really predict for sure what we're going to be um, finding in terms, of, uh, in terms of endogenous effort, for example. We also don't know what the information barriers are uh, to, to students learning from each other. Uh, you know, there, there could be, for example, segregation within a particular group. There could be, you know, shyness issues. There could be anything, you know, hidden information that the peer has that you don't have. Or, you know, we just don't know how information is, is, is communicated across people. Um, we also don't know how subgroups form. We also don't know what the preformed identities are of people that may influence the way they interact with each other. So there's just a whole bunch of social stuff that we don't know. So anything that we come up with from a peer effects perspective, you know, it can be, you can, you can try to come up with some sort of policy relevance, but at the end of the day, you just don't observe a lot of this stuff. And so it's, it's unclear that you come up with something that would be applicable outside the context that you uh, took it from. Apple and Romano have a nice review of peer effects literature up into that point in their um, chapter in the Handbook of Social Economics. Um, so I think that's a, that's a good source for other kinds of studies that have been done that are facing some of these barriers. Um, my colleague Paul and I also have a book in 2013 that talks much more about these kinds of things, subgroup formation and social identities and whatnot. Not in the context of peer effects, which is sort of more generally. Um, and that is sort of a direction that I think is helpful to be moving into in order to get more of a sense of how these subgroups might form. Okay, so how do people deal with all these problems? The first way that people have dealt with them, and this really started back in the 90s with Rusasado's paper, which is probably the most cited peer effects paper ever, um, was to capitalize on random assignment groups. So using Dartmouth College data, um, he basically, Rusasado basically said, well, well, Dartmouth College randomly assigns people to dormitories, and so I, I know that that breaks the link between own unobservable performance potential and peers' observed characteristics. And therefore, I can run an equation that predicts own performance from peer characteristics and not have to worry about that kind of endogeneity. Um, and then that was copied by many people, including myself and Lyle, and uh, you know, it's just a very common way to go. And one of the problems with it is that you are then estimating a peer effect for a randomly assigned group, which may arguably be different than a peer effect for a chosen group for all sorts of social reasons, right? So we were just talking about. So 
it's not perfect, but it gets you at least um, you know something that you can say. And if there is going to continue to be a random group assignment, then you know you might say, oh, it's still relevant because we we're still going to have this sort of situation. But there aren't that many cases in which, in reality, people are randomly assigned to uh, education settings. Another way to go is instrumental variables. So for those of you who are not an economist, instrumental variables <coughs> essentially is you're looking for some kind of um, external source of variation that influences people's choices uh, and breaks, again, breaks the link between those choices and the peer characteristics. Okay. So many people use uh, sort of some sort of policy change. In uh, Imberman's paper, a very nice paper, he takes the Hurricane Katrina data and basically some, stu some children were um, displaced with Hurricane Katrina back in the uh, 19, uh, it must have been 2000 something. They were displaced and they had to go to different schools. And of course these students were of different levels of ability and so other schools received them with different, you know, amounts of, uh, well, different numbers of students went to these different schools, and so that's arguably uh, an exogenous change in the peer groups for those students who were at, already at those schools. So he was able to essentially break the link between you know, the peer characteristics and own unobservables by uh, capitalizing on the sort of random influx of students. Other people have used things like the, the neighborhood uh, level of something or other, whether it's childbearing or um, and un unemployment or something like this to try an instrument for um, peer group characteristics at the school level. Another way to go is fixed effects. So um, Peter Osidiakonov and I have a paper, um, and also he wrote a paper in 2005, um, both of which are basically following a, a fixed effects kind of um, strategy. In this paper in 2005, he's essentially saying, well, there are differences across, um, uh, for example, medical schools in the quality of peers, but if I put in a fixed effect for the medical school and then I'm only looking within that school at different subgroups, then arguably there's less of a, of a link between own unobservables and peer characteristics. So again, trying to reduce that, that uh, endogenous problem. Now in terms of exogeneity, uh, that helping us to get around the endogeneity problem, there is one, again, Cooley's paper is the most recent one, um, she is trying to find a, a policy change which allows her to say, well, people are going to endogenously react to um, others' effort, but because of this policy change, they're going to, in, in fact, be putting out even more effort in the cases that are hit by the policy change than they would in cases that aren't hit by the policy change. And this, again, sort of breaks the link between this sort of give and take of effort. So she's trying to use that as a essentially another kind of instrument. It's more like a, a difference in difference, but it's essentially the, the idea being that you, you're taking some exogenous source of variation and using it to, um, to, to reduce the endogeneity problem in your peer effect study. But these are the common things that people do. Right? So here I know Maria is using random group assignment because apparently students here are randomly assigned to classrooms, so that's helpful. But again, you're then limited to talking about peer effects within random groups. So this is just a very, very simple sketch of what is typically done for those of you who aren't economists. Um, so you typically have some outcome that is measured at the level of an individual, a class, and a time, often. So sometimes that is across time, sometimes it's not, but if it is, then it's a time element. There's some sort of uh, you know, constant term. There's a whole bunch of stuff about the person that we know, whether that's their own you know, background, their own academic achievement, their race, their sex, etc. All that's multiplied by some vector beta. And then there's this peer effects business, right? Something, so gamma is then the peer effect that you want to estimate or identify. This P thing I just have standing in there as a placeholder. The peer effect itself is usually built on the basis of some number of characteristics of peers. So again, it can be their, their background, their uh, academic achievement, whatever it is. Um, and Sometimes it's actually estimated if you're talking about, for example, instrumental variables approaches, and then you end up with a predicted value of P. Sometimes it's not estimated, you're just literally defining it as some, some characteristics that the peers bring into the group. The reason why the I is in parentheses is because this is specific to a particular person, because you are not including the person in his own peer group, um, but it also you know, is not including I, right? So, so it has a, the subgrouping is horrible, sub, subscripting is awful if you're so you have this thing, sometimes you have fixed effects as well at different levels, and then you have your you know, random error. So this is typically what's done. Um, 
with this business, sometimes estimated and sometimes not. And so then that's the equation that you estimate. So it's just a bunch of papers doing exactly that, that strategy. And these are fairly recent papers. And these papers are getting into good journals. Right? So now, if you want to do an endogenous effects, then you know, you're assuming that the, this, this, this y, this outcome, is determined by something for the peers and is also determined by something else for you. Now, really, these things are the same if this model is correct, right? So you actually really want to put this whole equation, right, for the, for the peer in here. And that then causes all sorts of problems. So pe people typically don't do that. They just stick in the outcome and, you know, they include the other outcome on that side. Right? That's all they do. Um, but that's that's how you just write it. So, so Scott Carroll did this, and, and David Figlio has also used that kind of specification. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's basically not consistent, right? <laughs> this is not a, it's not a model where you can say, yes, this is exactly the same. You know, it's, it's just the y for oneself is determined exactly the same way as the y for my peers. So nonlinear peer effects is another thing people do. They will just take the, the standard peer effect, whatever it is, and then they'll also interact that with something about the individual students being affected. So this ICT then gets interacted with the peer uh, measure, peer ability measure. So I think that Maria's paper had something like that in it. You can then also have another kind of model where there's heterogeneous, heterogeneous effects of some sort. So for example, the bad apple and the shining star effects where you're saying, well, what we care about is not the average level of peer achievement, but rather the, you know, worst level in the group and then also the best level in the group. Um, and these kinds of models, again, are, you know, they're used fairly frequently, but we don't really know why. We don't know whether it's in fact that this is the, you know, the, the correct model. We just basically throw it in there and say, well, maybe so. And it sounds sexy, so people publish it. So that's another way of uh, making the peer effects not linear. One of the problems with the linear peer effects model, which has been pointed out by Hopsby, is essentially if you don't if you know, if you think that this is really the way that peer effects are generated, right, then there's, there's essentially this thing is a, an average of ability measures, some x, right, and that that linearly affects one's own outcome. Then there's no policy implication in terms of redistributing peers across different um, groups. Right? There's basically you can't get any more social welfare by distributing them one way versus another way. So in order to generate any policy relevance in terms of social sorting, you actually need to have some nonlinear which has been one of the reasons why we've moved towards these kinds of models, right? And then another way to go, and this is what um, I do with Peter in 2012, and also Brevin Sasson to use the model, the same method, is to essentially es estimate an own um, potential, an own sort of ability, if you will, and then recombine that thing as the peer effect itself. So, uh, so my fixed effects then goes into the peer effect for my classmates. You can't do this very easily in a one-shot thing. You have to iterate. So we have essentially an iterative structure whereby we first make a guess about what this innate ability is, and then that gets recombined uh, in the, by peer group, essentially. And we then deliver estimates for this gamma, which is the thing we care about, and then also delta, which is maybe a, a classroom-specific effect, for example. Um, now, the reason this is appealing is that you then, this is another way of breaking the link between own unobservables and peer characteristics, observable characteristics. Um, the reason why that works is because the fixed effect itself is capturing sort of everything about the person that is relevant to their performance, ideally, you know, supposedly. Now, if it's not fixed, then we have a problem. We're just assuming that it's fixed in our method, but you are capturing at least more stuff that you don't have to actually have in the exam. You don't have to observe things about the student. You just say, look, whatever it is that helps them perform better, we think that that's also helping the peers to perform better. Okay, so that's a, one way around it. So there's other kinds of approaches people have used. Uh, sometimes people have, and, and uh, Boucher et al. in 2014 have this paper that says, well, maybe that we can use changes in the mechanical covariance between own and peers' attributes because group size is changing. So and this is going back to Angus's example, right? In a group of three, you'd expect a fairly strong covariance in, you know, between own and peer attributes. But if you increase the group size, then you're going to have less of that. And so you can sort of use that to identify uh, peer effects across multiple different group sizes. You can also do a variance decomposition kind of approach. So Graham has an econometrical paper in 2008 that does this. Um, you can also take a completely different approach and say, well, ask whether people believe that there are peer effects. If students believe that there are peer effects, then they should be operating according to them. Um, so I do that with, again with Paul in 2010. So there's 
many different you know kinds of approaches that are used, but uh, none of them really uh, I think is, is thought of yet as perfect. Right? People are still struggling with that. And one of the reasons why people struggle is because of this endogeneity problem, which I want to talk about a little more. So what we mean by endogeneity is essentially that, that, that people are choosing something that is relevant to their performance in the group, based on what they observe in the group. Not, not something that we can control, not something we can observe previously, and this is happening for all people in the group. So if, if in an economic sense, we would often think about a utility function where you have some payoff to doing well, and then you also have a cost to actually working hard. So you might think that you know, there's, a, there's a, a negative quadratic cost function, and you have this benefit. What if your production, though, is a function not just of your own effort right, and your own ability, let's say, but also of your peers' effort and your peers' ability. And then maybe there's an interaction between your own effort and ability and your peers' effort and ability. Right? So there, there are ways in which your, your effort choice, then, is going to depend upon the other person's effort choice and their ability. And of course, their effort choice then depends upon your effort choice, and that, that makes it a big mess. So Cooley, again, has probably the best paper that, that deals with this problem. This is just a you know, sort of simple two-person model. But in terms of a larger peer group, this kind of thing might be happening all the time. And that's yeah, very, very difficult to model. So I would say that's probably the biggest frontier at the moment, is how do we actually uh, accommodate endogenous effort. So I thought, because you guys are writing peer effects papers, I would just go through some of the mistakes that I commonly see. The first mistake that I see is essentially overselling the social influence relative to other factors. People write, write a peer effects paper and they say, oh, you know, it really matters whether you're with a, a classroom of, you know, very high achievers versus very low achievers, when really what's going on, the biggest thing that, that is happening is maybe about, you know, the, the teaching style of the, the teacher or the quality of the teacher or the quality of the individual's preparation or something like this. So that's the first uh, thing. And, you, you know, I, it's nice to see uh, a comparison of the importance of the social context compared to other things. That are going on. Um, people often don't have enough checks on randomization or interpretability. Um, so, people, you know, to, to check a randomization, if you're using randomization as, as an identification strategy, you want to try to run some equation that says, is my own background characteristic related to the peer's background characteristics? If it is, then you have some sort of non random assignment problem. So, that, I don't see that often done enough. Um, there's often grand claims about policy relevance. Again, there's often sort of, oh, yes, we know that if we identify things properly and you know this model is correct, then we'll be able to assign students to classrooms in a, in a more efficient way. Um, but it's just often not believable. So I, I'd rather not even see that, I'd rather sort of see it much more as a, you know, here is in this particular context, this is my best estimate of how, thing, how the social effects might work. Um, and mainly, there's insufficient thought about the mechanism. That's probably the biggest problem. And the mechanism is, of course, the you know the thing that is unseen, and that's why it's the most difficult thing to try to, to analyze. So if you're writing something and you're thinking about the mechanism, the first thing I would say is you want to be thinking about whether the social influence story you have in mind is actually possibly feasible. Could people be spending enough time together to you know jointly learn things or to exchange information about the production function or um, you know, change their their attitude towards study. For example, is there is there pressure being being applied in the group towards better performance, or is it considered you know not as good to perform well as it is in some cases? Um, so, how would that mechanism actually work? What kinds of expectations or psychology mechanisms must be happening in order to actually support that kind of social influence story? Okay. Which is very much thinking about you know psychology and, and sociology. Um, if you're using random assignment, can you actually say something about policy? Um, are your results going to hold in a select context, which they may not in many cases? Although, again, we don't know why if we don't know exactly what the theory is for um, how peer effects are being generated in a selected context. Um, do you really have enough variation to estimate social effects if they're even there? So some people try to estimate peer effects models on, uh, on data sets where you just you don't have a lot of variation from peer group to peer group, so you just don't have very much to work with. So even if there were effects, um, you're not going to find it. And that's one of the problems with um, uh, Arshidi Akhano's paper in 2005. Once you, once you put in fixed effects at various levels, like at the level of the individual school, you're kind of knocking out an awful lot of peer group variation across the population. So you're not really able to, to, to use much variation. So you're going to get a, a 
a weaker result. In terms of measurement, is the social input that you're measuring one that's the most important from a conceptual viewpoint? So oftentimes, again, the thing you're measuring is, uh, you know, something like their, their score on some test coming in, but that may not be relevant to their performance in the, in, you know, the classroom today, or to their effort provision, or, you know, uh, to, to whatever output you think is, is matters. Is the social input that you're measuring actually useful for policy? Is there something that, you know, you can say to a policymaker who has the potential to change the institutional structure? Again, Jane Cooley has a really nice uh, paper on this, saying that essentially, no, in many cases, it's not the case. Um, and, you know, Angrist's uh, paper, again, asks whether or not there is the possibility of coming up with some sort of uh, interpretation about social effects, or in fact, whether it's about really mechanical correlations between home and group. Um, what's the chronology of choices and social influence? So how are people I mean, making their choices about whether to put effort in or not, or um, you know, whether to come to class, for example, or not, or study or not, or become part of a subgroup or not? And how are those groups formed? Right? All these, these questions, which people, again, they aren't asking very much in the literature at the moment, but they, because it's very difficult to answer them. Um, so yes. The ways I think that, you know, in terms of the frontier, the ways I think that we can progress are first of all trying to come up with some sort of um, more formal theory that proposes and tests various causal pathways that leads to social influence. So, um, you know, is, it, is really what happens between students a question of forming a bond which then um, sort of supports them in, the, in you know, when they sort of don't have as much uncertainty about their outcome? Is it more that there is an interaction between them in terms of information provision about how education gets produced? Um, you know, what kind of mechanisms are actually happening there? Is it, is it more costly for somebody than to, to do worse because there's a competitive effect? You know, what, what is it actually that's causing social event to happen? Um, and any kind of supporting empirics that might come from, you know, information flow uh, differences across different groups, um, how expectations are formed and whether that can be uh, adjusted by, you know, having different kinds of group types, how friendships form, how loyalty forms and subgroups form, um, you know, what is the theory of that and what is the actual evidence for what's happening in the classroom or, you know, in, in a broader course. Um, and how do various aspects of the self affect people's interaction with others and therefore the amount of, of, of learning that they can have in those contexts. Um, and certainly I think there's a lot uh, of interest in terms of power structures and um, how those power structures influence people to be to conform to particular social norms versus actually, you know, just because it's expedient, versus actually to, to form loyalties or longer loyalties, which may then bring about different kinds of effects in the social context. So in terms of estimation, again, the main thing that people are um, concerned with at the moment that seems to be a blockage is this behavioral endogeneity problem. So we're trying to come up with more estimation techniques that can accommodate that um, without being you know, affected, affected by these spillovers or mechanical correlations and still be policy relevant. And that's just a huge, huge challenge. Um, I also think that you know it would be nice to have more group level analysis methods. And I'm more moving in that direction myself because, again, being tethered to the individual model when you'd like to make statements about the whole group is um, somewhat hampering. So the kind of experimentation that I've seen, so again, um, Cooley has a couple of papers on stimulation. I think stimulation is a really interesting way to go. So you can set up some you know, proposed model of social influence in a, an agent-based kind of modeling situation and see which kinds of group constructs would actually result in better outcomes for a whole group um, without having the messiness of real life and then you know, test those individual assumptions maybe in the lab or in small small studies. So that's that's one way that you could you know, imagine doing some experiments. Another way is to actually go into an experimental laboratory and, and study people's reactions to signals about people's group, about the group behavior. So an example of this that I'm doing at the moment is in relation to how people respond to um, norms that differ by um, basically what the people are finding out what the norms are by interacting with the group over time. So in certain groups, we set up certain groups to have norms of sort of uh, a very high level of sharing and other groups to have norms of a very low level of sharing. And we set people free in these groups and see how long it takes them to learn that they should share more in order to get rewarded with the groups that's sharing. So that's not really about um, 
I mean, it is sort of individual level analysis, but we're doing it in the lab, and we're really talking about changing an entire group's um, set of norms. Um, which again is one way that peer effects may happen is through norm formation, but that's not something that is typically measured as separate from um, you know, sort of standard peer effect studies. Okay, so the rest of this is just references, and I'm happy to send you any of those, or you can look them up on your own, and you can keep the presentation. Okay, I'm happy to take much. questions. So one thing I didn't see you mention is like you mentioned nonlinearity, but one of the nonlinearities doesn't that concerns me mm -hmm. is nonlinearity in endogenous group formation. Mm -hmm. So one way of thinking yep. about this is that right there there might be threshold effects. It, it might be especially noticeable when you think about say racial subgroup formation. So think about the differences in right. There's all these stories about how say for blacks, yep. um, if there's only represented two percent of the university, sure. their willingness to clump together may be very yep. different than their fifty percent. Yep, 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 absolutely. So tokenism. I mean, this is a, this is a, in sociology. This has already been looked at a lot, right? And so you have this notion of fractionalization. If you have a, a small enough fraction, and if you have a larger fraction, then you sort of become part of the, the larger group. And also, this happens with group size. If a group gets a, a bigger, you know, bigger right. than maybe it's 20 or something, then you start having this sort of fractionalization of small subgroups. Sure. But again, you have to make some sort of assumption about that if you want to identify something. Oh, so, good. right, so that, that's the issue. And we don't really know, right? We, we, economics is just way behind in those sorts of questions. We don't, you know, the, the, the literature on um, subgroup formation that is, that is most developed is in psychology and sociology, just not as much in economics. So from because my I was wondering, is, could you do it at the group level? at least start fishing. So for instance, I was thinking of Asians, right. because you could look at the University of California, the percentage of Asians who are admitted to the UC system yep. has dramatically increased over time, the last 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. So you could look at sort of see whether there are group effects, mm -hmm. of peer effects, and whether those are correlated over time mm -hmm. with changes in, in, in the UC system's admissions. Okay, rate. so you're thinking basically in, in cases where there's a larger fraction of Asian students that they might be less influenced by each other as a subgroup or the in opposite. a larger group. Or it might be the other way around. Or the other way around. They're, they're, they're more likely to. They're, they're more yeah. likely to. Yep, yep, yep. So you can certainly think about that. You, again, the theory that's underlying it is sort of bereft of economic content, but you can certainly say, look, if this is the way it's going, then let's look for the evidence Correct. of that. Correct. Right? The idea is that sure. you fish for a behavioral thing, then you sure. try to develop a causal sure. story. I mean, you're essentially talking about assimilation, then, right? So right. an assimilation is something that I think is, is Definitely, I mean, you're talking about a peer effect in a, in a sort of big, you know, writ large. Assimilation is when you come, you know, and you sort of start behaving like everybody else because you've been there for long enough. Correct. And there are papers that, you know, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought about them for this, but the papers that are looking at sort of immigrants and, you know, how they perform relative to natives over time and how many generations does it take for them to catch up sort of thing. Um, and you certainly see that the, the more, you know, the longer you're in the group, the more you sort of start assimilating. And you might find the same thing when you have a smaller versus a larger subset of your particular type. But you're also then relying on the existing formation, the existing uh, sort of identification of these people as Asian, right? I am Asian, rather than I am a student, right? Or I am a woman, right? Or I am whatever, right? And that, that's, again, that's sort of a, yeah, an initial assumption. You have a question. I do, because no one else is putting up their hands. Um, so I guess the reality of, of the tertiary institutions that you're looking at, students, is that the general belief is that whatever these peer effects are, they're not big enough to worry about. Absolutely. Because neither institutions, nor professors, nor tutors really spend much time thinking about how to design study groups, or who sleeps where. So the implicit presumption is this stuff, whatever it is, is small. Mm -hmm. Compared to the quality of the teacher, compared mm -hmm. to screening out students who are not very good, compared to disruption, or Absolutely. compared to you know a PowerPoint presentation versus chalk, Absolutely. this doesn't matter. Now, is there a headline figure that you can say, look, the peer effects literature indeed has found it doesn't matter so much. So yeah, we are trifling at the square millimeter, or is there at least some indication that no, no, this matters more than trivial yeah. because. At the moment, the default is this doesn't matter. Yep. Why am I here? Yep, yep, yep. Um, so I think it very much depends on what level of analysis you're talking about. If you're talking about an individual university, as opposed to like the entire world of students, you're talking about just within a university, can you uh, generate really large gains from um, from different kinds of groups depending on what's happening in them? 
not nearly as much as you can by simply taking higher quality students into the university, or simply hiring better quality teachers, or even lowering the class size. Right? So those things at the university level simply don't matter. Now, if you're talking about um, sort of across an entire uh, society, the extent to which the social environment influences the student from a you know from from age say five up to age eighteen. That, sure, you can imagine there'd be very, very large effects. And then you're talking about a long time of being socialized and all this sort of thing. So for a university who has a student for three years, you know, and already and has, has the potential to hire and fire different kinds of tutors and adjust class sizes and change their admission structures, those are the much, much easier, much bigger bang for the buck kind of adjustments that we make. And uh, we know this now. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I don't so, think there's um, peer effects so these, are. Uh, these studies show whatever the peer effects are, they're always small. Whatever they're you, small. You again, if you're considering a, a simple, like a, a university across multiple, you know, say three or four years, way smaller than than your own characteristics. My own characteristics are just hugely important. Yeah. Isn't there an exception to that? Uh, but the problem is that, of course, we don't know what's the real cost. Yeah. But I thought the exception to that is the autonomy work of the rural Catholic schools. So, you, because, because there you could argue that the peer effects interaction with the choice of the treatment. You yeah. could say peer effects don't work in a kind of laissez-faire American university where you're all supposed to do your thing. Yeah. But Altonji, when he redid all the Komal stuff, mm -hmm. showed that sure. even controlling for randomness and blah, 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 money spent, there is a positive Catholic effect sure. on low-income students, and it's huge. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but part of the Catholic treatment mechanism is not just uh, discipline, but limited punishment of the worst cases. But that's surely a peer effect because the idea is that there's a kind of, by, by affecting, how, because you have this contamination effect, and you clamp down on the worst students, then that doesn't contaminate the others. Yeah. But that's yeah. a peer effect that's not peers by itself, yeah, right? No, no. It's, it's peer effects yeah. in cross, crossing the choice of the intervention, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, so this notion of disruptive students, right? So David Fugley also has this paper on, you know, disruptive students, boys named Sue, or so. And, and that does seem to have an effect. But again, he's studying schools at the lower than university level, right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking about primary schools, secondary schools. And, and you are talking then about sort of, uh, yeah, an intervention with respect to particular negative influence. It's kind of like a bad apple sort of effect. You say, okay, take those bad apples out, control them in some way, and then you'll get a much better result for these students. And that, that's true. But again, if you compare the, the size of those effects, to, you know, mother's education, for example, or, or you know, own um, academic preparation or, or effort level, there's often, it, it's, I mean, it's not that they're small, they're not as small as they are at university level, but they're just, they're not necessarily, um, you know, they're, they're not where I would put my money necessarily if I were the policymaker, right? Because you can't just start in Catholic school. If you're going to be saying, oh, let's control discipline, you know, let's, let's make disciplinary adjustments within a classroom, okay, that's, that might, a good idea, sure. But, I mean, can I push you a little bit yeah, on this? Yeah, yeah. Because you made, you made a claim that your benchmark was mother's education. Mm -hmm. But now, if you're going to use mother's education, you're right into the nature and nurture paradigm. Yep. And in fact, Sasser does work. Yep. If you're going to take that as the benchmark, assume that the mother's education effect is 90% genetics and 10% culture. Yep. Then, then, by that standard, almost everything fails, right? So the Sasser dot Korean study blows out all parental intervention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. If, if you're willing, I mean, so the issue is that since everything except genetics, tends to only matter in large clumps, then by definition, any one piece of it, it's like personality, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff now with Heckman that non-cognitive matters, but yeah. it's only when you aggregate all the non-cognitive. Yeah, sure. If you take individual sure. non-cognitive, they're very small yeah. relative to genetics, sure. right? Sure, sure, sure. So, so yeah. sure. Okay, well, fair enough. I mean, the policy, policy choice is often, though, not across multiple different things, right? You're talking right. about one particular policy affecting one particular uh, you know, aspect of the social environment, right? right? If you could change everything about the social environment, yeah, you can change a lot, okay. <laughs> sure. But you know that's not typically the choice that we're facing, right? I mean, the kind of the kind of policy choices the universities have are typically around admissions, around you know sorting into classrooms or whatever, teacher selection and class size. And you know, if you if you, if you wanted to move on any of those and really get a, a big bang for your buck in terms of outcome, it's admissions, because you can select people, you know, higher level students, higher ability students, if that's what you can actually do. But they also don't do one thing, which is to say Americans are great inflated. If they change, sure. for instance, one issue that, that disrupt is bad sure. If Americans created stricter standards, so say 10% even of students at Harvard flunked out, yep. how would, what yep. kind of effects would that have? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, what are you Well, I, I don't want to let him get away with the statement that genetics is bound to matter a lot, because that, 
is still very contentious. Okay, right? so call it cognitive ability there, but still early childhood. Yes, but, 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 but more generally, right? Yeah. Because there's high heritability of, 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 as it were, you know, IQ and schooling outcomes is not believed to be holding over time across countries. So over time across countries, we think it's all policy. So it's more the cross-sectional stuff that makes us believe that you know, there's something fixed being passed on, but we don't really know what it is. There too, we have the missing mechanisms. Well, but and I mean, the missing I, genes, by the way. We, well, we can't find the genes that is, yeah. are doing the work either. So, but, but so, so that's, a, that's another controversial area, sure. right? <laughs> but the point is that nobody's dealt with the sacerdote critique, but that's the issue. The, the, the adoption side in Korea, and that is the, that is the really... The yeah, really I mean, but it, that kind of relies on this artificial modification as well, between genetics and, and nurture. And sure, that's why he, I mean, that's why I think people haven't dealt with it, because it's like, oh, yeah, okay. There's just too much in there that you can't, um, yeah, you can't really believe this bifurcation, so you kind of don't engage with it. But look, I mean, I think it's, from, from my perspective, you do want to understand what's happening, but you also want to give, give you know, helpful advice to universities and not, not you know, sort of think, well, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to do my sort of ivory tower exercise and not come up with something that can actually help the, the group's formation. And, as Paul said, I mean, basically, the we're not seeing a lot of collaboration between universities and researchers. We see a bit of it with Scott Carroll's, and when it happens, it falls on his face. Which, again, tells me, you know, this is not what we want to be operating most of the time in terms of mechanisms. So we need to actually spend more time on the, the mechanisms and the, and the theory behind what's actually happening before we can really intervene in the real world and can have an effect. Yeah. And, and people have challenged the psychedelic type studies on that because people ask, well, how actually do adopted parents get selected? True. Uh, that usually is, is sort of mired in a bureaucracy, which is not random. People sure. do not randomly assign you know, adopted kids, even if they're separating between the two sure, sure. There's usually an enormous bureaucratic machinery going into the selection of parents, which is where a lot of endogenous. But all you're doing is you're restricting the range. You're restricting the range, but it says within that range, huge income differences don't matter. Yeah. Okay, no. well, <laughs> Maybe one will ask the others. Mary had a public comment. What I think is maybe the source of her lead in terms of policy wise is her, for example, online education, mm -hmm. like online learning platforms. Yeah. Because uh, what the research, for example, of Coursera says that there is very dropout rates. So, how many people? How many students were and yeah. depends on the quality of the um, forum associated with the course. The online platform that you can chat, chat with instructors mm -hmm. and also with peers, mm -hmm. which means that if you run two courses one after another, mm -hmm. and you change the gear, the structure of gear interaction, yep. within the like grade segment, you can get different. So this is in the same uh, boat as many of the other pedagogical technique, pedagogical design studies that I've seen, right? And like we were talking about earlier also, you know, you have uh, this push towards more group-based learning, and so you may have a, a different kind of design for tutorials, which is more interactive compared to the more traditional chalk and talk, and people want to know, you know, which of these works better. I've, I've, I think I have never seen a, a really properly designed randomized control trial of those kinds of differences. The only thing I have seen that is somewhat similar is there was a, at the development of um, an online um, sort of interactive gamified way of teaching microeconomics, which literally puts the student into a whole world where there's you know little bots, little, little agents that are you know animated and that are either choosing to fish or choosing to farm, and they can trade with each other and they're on their own little island and there's those all these different constraints. They have to sleep. They have to form you know various different links with the economy. And the students learn microeconomic concepts through this gamified, basically, version of the, the textbook. And then there was a test of whether this or the traditional textbook was better in terms of getting them to learn. Now, it's not really a social effect exactly, right? It's sort of social in the sense that when they're in the game, they're playing with other students, maybe, right? So you're sort of seeing something like this. But you can imagine different kinds of pedagogical te techniques being tested. That's true. And if you did a proper randomized control trial, you know, that might work out. Because, but it's, it's often difficult to get that past the ethics committees, at least at my university. Um, and you know, you have to get a collaboration with the curriculum designer for a particular course. And typically those who are doing this research are not the ones who are also teaching the courses, and so you, you know, there's a little bit of a disconnect there. But yeah, I think that could be a, a interesting thing. And that would actually have direct policy implications, potentially. Yeah. yeah. yeah.
so I have a question about this thesis that economists, uh, economists uh, don't understand how friendships work. Yeah. Uh, as far as I understood from pure effect studies, uh, like economists uh, don't really care about that. So they care about like a random group or some cohort yep. or school or whatever. Yep. So and why? Uh, why? Uh, maybe admit why do you think that it's important? Like for economists to understand this, like uh, yep. how friendship ties are formed or how social connections are formed. Yeah. Well, so I think it's important for understanding, but not as much for policy relevance in terms of the questions that are often asked by administrators uh, in relation to their intervention in policy. So the reason why you might do it the way that a traditional economist does and forget about friendship formation, just look at individual classes or individual dorms or something, is because that's the that's the thing that the university can. The university cannot monitor or change French consciousness. People will choose their friends, right, and that's it. We can do anything about it. Forget about trying to influence that, right? We're not going to be able to put a rule or a regulation. You may not be a friend with somebody. All we can do is say, well, you're going to be assigned to this group, or you're not going to be assigned. Or this is the mechanism of assignment, or whatever. So, from a policy perspective, it's it's you know it's not directly relevant. It's indirectly relevant only through the fact that it can allow us to understand what was going on. So, my friendship formation paper, for example. What I was trying to do was essentially find out how much people are um, are flocking together, are, are doing the sort of assimilating with each other, or I should say, uh, selectively sorting into groups that are similar. And the reason I could do it is because I'm start I was starting from a randomized base, so I had people who were in randomized groups in one year, and then in the second year they could choose their friends from those groups. So then I'm sort of saying, well, there's all these potential friendships that might form, you know, between every individual person and every other person in the randomized group. Which of those actually get observed in the second year? So it's a, a pair. It was a pairwise analysis. So for each pair, does it happen or does it not? And for me, that's interesting because I'm saying, well, you know, it, it may be that we can only look at these these broad groups of you know people as the you know in the randomized context. But in reality, people are choosing to be with certain others who may be similar to them, and that may be um, more influential, you know, on their outcomes. Now, another paper that I have actually looks at whether their the friends are more influential than randomized peers and finds that they're not. And again, there's a reason for why that might be. If you're choosing people who are already like you, then you're not being as surprised by their behavior. Maybe you're, you know, you simply don't don't get pushed off your equilibrium path by people you kind of are you can expect their behavior. Whereas somebody who's not like you. You think, oh my gosh, right? That's that's challenging, particularly for a young person. Maybe they start to be really influenced by that more than they are by their friends. Right? So, well, again, yeah, we don't really know these things, but I, I think it's important because I'd like to, I just like to know, um, you know, what the what the what the main sort of choice mechanisms are that people have that could influence their outcomes. So, that, you know, when I choose a particular friend, does that influence me in some way? I'd like to be able to answer that question, even though it's you know very fraught. I still think it's the, that's, that's essentially what is often happening in the real world. We don't get random assignment in a lot of places. We do get self-selection. So, do I, do I, for example, tell my child, ah, oh, stay away from all those guys over there smoking cigarettes? Or do I say, you know, it doesn't really matter because you are yourself. And, you know, even if you're in the same classroom with them, you know, if they're a small proportion of them, it's not going to matter. Right? I think I probably tell my kid to stay away from the people who are, you know, shooting up drugs, right? I probably do that. And so that means that there must be something about self-selection that matters to people. Any more questions? Yep. Yeah, one more thing. So now, I, I thought you jumped a little too quickly. The schools have no influence on in this. Because this mm -hmm. is exactly my point about endogeneity yeah. um, and uh, about nonlinearity. Okay. Imagine, for instance, that people self-select in terms of, say, good students. Yep. A, a like selects like. But the rate at which they do it also affects their ability to benefit. So in other words, if you start them out scattered throughout the university and they grew, they don't do as well as if they start out together and they grew because they can now, there's like a nonlinear effect. Okay. So just imagine that's true for a second. Yeah. For whatever reason. Okay. There's, there's a lot of reasons that could be true. Sure. Transactions cost, whatever. Okay. But the school can affect that, right? So by creating an honors college. And yeah. so a world in which the school, so it's still endogenous, but a world in which the school randomly assigns students to classes versus the world in which the school has honors class and you get segregation, sure, sure. then allows them to self-select in a rapid way yep. so that the benefits of being self-select are boosted. Sure, so absolutely. that could potentially be tested even later. No, that's true, that's true. So I mean, you can, you can basically set up the social environment in such a way that it makes it more likely for certain friendships to form, right? right. So yes, totally. And I mean, oftentimes they do the opposite, right? 
Exactly. <laughs> I actually try not to scream, right? But we would be, again, everything, every implication that you draw from this literature relies on assumptions. Our assumption was that there are complementarities in peer and own effort. If that's the case, then our implication is that you should stream, mm -hmm. right? You should put the smart kids with smart kids, the dumb kids with dumb kids, and that's that's the best thing overall, right? But that's very unpolitically correct. Exactly. So, yeah, so oftentimes you don't see people saying that. There's supposed to be people advocating it. That's why Carol's paper got the, I think, one of the reasons why Carol uh, Scott got the approval to run with his implications and actually, you know, implement them because it sounded cool. Yeah, but all the low ability kids with high ability kids. That sounds redistributional and very nice. They work. Yeah. People believe it's good to flock together. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So they will. Welcome to Charles. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.